the participants of the talk. Frida Nake, born 1938, is an icon of computer art. He was one of the first three humans worldwide ever who had the idea to use a computer to make art in 1965. Frida Nake, Georg Nees and A. Michael Noll, the famous Ens. Ana Maria Caballero from Colombia is an award-winning multidisciplinary literary artist. In 2024, she became the first living poet to sell a poem at Sotheby's. Recognized as a digital poetry pioneer, she generates artworks combining text and images. Anna exhibits in museums and galleries worldwide. Tyler DeWitt from Canada, better known by his moniker Deef Beef, is an electrical engineer who worked in the field of computer animation. He is also a classically trained musician. His multimedia artworks include music, sound recording, computer animation, blacksmithing and generative art. His latest generative works adopting blockchain technology recently gained wide attention. The talk is moderated by Susanne Pech. Dear participants, I'm very happy that we have this round together. It is really marvelous. Tyler is joining us as an avatar, I have to tell you. Um, but I can promise to you that his voice is real. So he is a human. Be sure about that. <laughs> <laughs> I, of course, want to start with Frida and give him his first word. Frida, uh, looking to generative art of today, uh, did you have any clue when you started in the 60s to use computers to make art? Did you have any clue about that, what is happening today? Not at all. No. Uh, just absolutely zero. Uh, if not minus 1,000. Uh, and uh, of course you start speculating, I started speculating uh, in February 1966 when I had a second exhibition in Darmstadt and that exhibition uh, got a rather large, should I say, review in the uh, German daily newspaper um, FAZ Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung. Um, so the fact that they spent half a page of their newspaper on that exhibition in Darmstadt, that made me think a bit deeper, oh, is what I'm doing, is that of any relevance? Because uh, before such a newspaper that spends half a page in their cu cultural section, uh, there must be a decision in, in, in the uh, uh, um, journalist's group. You know? And apparently, the, of, of course, the review was totally negative, really. You know? Negative in the sense, oh, now there are people in Stuttgart who have access to computers in their mid-1960s, nobody had access to a computer, uh, and they do drawings, and they claim this should be considered to be something like art. Now, they made fun of this. But this, in, in my reception, uh, gave a totally different uh, reasoning. Namely, if they write so negatively, then there must be something interesting. They are a conservative paper, and when the conservatives say something negative, I, then I was young, um, I was in my mid-twenties, uh, then this made me think maybe there is something. However, I had no clue of you know, the complexity of current visual appearances. The clue was more of the kind, oh, perhaps, perhaps I'm doing something that may become interesting uh, in the future, perhaps. So, Anna, my first question to you and later then also to, um, to Tyler, 
how did your interest uh, of, in the history of generative art, in your own art, begin on your side? Uh, have you been interested since the very beginning or did it come even later when you already started and worked as an artist? Hi, Suzanne. It's wonderful to be here. Hi, Frida and Tyler. Um, thank you for, for having us. I'm really looking forward to the to the summit that we're having this summer in, in Berlin and, and to meeting everybody. Um, as, as Suzanne mentioned, I am a poet uh, by, by training, let's say, and by, by primary uh, and primordial craft. Um, I've been writing my whole life in both Spanish and English. Um, I've published six books and I'm working on my seventh manuscript and really started transforming my works into, into digital works of art um, pretty early on in my practice when I realized that the traditional publishing Uh, world didn't really offer much to writers, doesn't offer much to writers who are experimental um, like I am and who who really um, like to play with grammar. And I, I enter your question from, from here because, of course, grammar, I think, is, is a system, is a generative system of meaning, of signification, of imagery. And I think um, that that you know, when you play with grammar, um, you can really start creating different, different artworks um, that become um, randomized or generative, let's say, in in the reader's mind, um, and and every reader will will have a different experience of what you write based on their own personal experience, of course. Um, but I think that my my interest in in the history of generative art came after I encountered new definitions to me of generativity, because as a writer and as a poet, um, you're always going to generative writing <laughs> workshops. Um, and, you know, here the definition is, is different. You know, you're invited to a workshop, even during my MFA, you go to a generative poetry workshop and basically you're giving prompts. You're, you're given perhaps something to read or you're asked to, to write, for example, a poem that looks like a subpoena, you know, or, or like, a, or like a, a bill of rights, but turn it into a poem or something like that, right? These are all prompts. These are all generative workshops where you're supposed to generate responses um, that are poetic and, and handwritten. Um, but then of course, when I entered the digital art world, inevitably I came across um, code-based generative art and realize um, that it, there's a whole new way of understanding it. And, and the way that I bring it together with what I do um, follows a definition that I first heard from Casey Reese, which is um, he subscribes the definition of generative art as the artist makes the system and the system makes the art. And I feel like I make the system, uh, which is grammar, which is a book, but the system then creates art in in, in the speakers, in the reader's mind. And um, through this reading, I've been able to, to identify works. One of my favorite uh, works of classic literature as generative, for example, Julio Cortázar, um, one of the most beloved Argentinian writers wrote what many consider the first hypertext novel in 1960s, um, in which it's a choose your own adventure. It's 155 chapters and you can read it as ever, however you want. And for me, I can now identify this as a generative system. Um, I think the work of Clarice Lispector, a Brazilian writer who also broke with the rules of grammar in a very transgressive way, should be defined as, as generative. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot. So uh, before going to, uh, to uh, Tyler, um, ju just a short remark on my side. Uh, we are talking about language and usually think about human language, which has emotions and feelings and everything thing like that. But moving to code, this is also a language. This is a language which was maybe invented by humans, maybe invented by nature. We will not discuss this today, probably, but uh, it is a kind, it is also a language. It doesn't have emotions, but it is a system and has rules in it. And you, Tyler, you came uh, from the other side into the generative art, I think. So perhaps you can give us uh, your thoughts about that. Sure. Uh, thank you. I just want to say it's an honor to speak with all of you. Um, 
Uh, so yeah, my own history with with generative art. Um, so my 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 story has been sort of a wandering one. I've uh, I've bounced around between a lot of different things since like over the past twenty years, in, intersecting art and and technology. Um, it wasn't one principled study of any one field. Uh, so at times I've uh, I've been interested in music, uh, sound recording. Uh, I did some computer graphics research. Um, I make uh, kinetic machines. I work with metal as a, as a blacksmith. Uh, so I'm very interested in in craft and techniques. I ne I never studied art until quite recently, uh, but I've always been drawn to um, inspired by uh, uh, creative expression or inquiry from from people from tactical backgrounds, whether that's uh, science or craft. Um, so my first my first exposure to what I guess what we would say is 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 uh, generative art was as a young child. Um, we had a computer. And uh, um, I had a game that procedurally generated um, the the level. So every time that you played, it was something different. And as a child, that was just completely fascinating. Like it blew my mind. We didn't have a lot of computer games. You couldn't just download them all the time. So to have something that every time you played was new, that was a, a formative experience. And that really, that was why I wanted to learn techniques. That's what I wanted to learn about programming computers was because of the magic of that. Um, so later, I originally undertook um, study in electrical engineering. And the motivation, again, was kind of a romantic one, uh, kind of a naive one. I wanted to like unlock the secrets of uh, sound and electronics in order to build things like audio synthesizers or kinetic machines. It was about the mystery of complex dynamic systems and feedback. And also the aesthetics, like the, the aesthetics of um, you know, glowing oscilloscopes and CRT monitors juxtaposed with, you know, computer terminals, right? Like discrete symbols, cryptic on a screen. So those aesthetics were really powerful to me. And you see that, I think, reflected in, in uh, some of my artwork. Um, so I learned along the way that many of the things I was interested in were not what people were researching. <laughs> they were not interested <laughs> in doing research in that in an in a electrical engineering research department. But as it happens... Um, in grad school, uh, um, I switched to uh, a computer graphics research group at the University of Toronto, which has a very rich history uh, dating back to the 1960s. Um, and uh, I know I know that Frieder was was a postdoc there in the 1960s. And later, I'd really love to hear him speak about that uh, experience. But basically, my that was a big influence. Um, uh, being in that group, it's a mixture of you know, there's artists, there's scientists, there's a cross pollination between those things. Um, and it was through that experience that I really learned more about the history of computer animation and being inspired by many of many of those uh, those pioneering figures. I think, Frida, you have you have to give some reflections from your side now. <laughs> That's amazing. No, because here <laughs> we see each other and a young fellow. <laughs> Sorry, Tyler. <laughs> Tells me you must have met Leslie Messer. Have you? I I have not met him because I joined. I was only there for a brief period in 2010. But like ah, I know okay. people that did know him. Eugene Fume was my supervisor, and uh -huh. Ron Baker was there, but he joined a little bit later. Yeah. Um, he spoke at the 40th anniversary, but it was just before that I joined. Um, yeah. He is here in Toronto. I've watched some of his uh, speaking, but I haven't met him. Yeah. Um. Again, I, my philosophy is life has no sense, doesn't make any sense whatsoever. It is just a series of anecdotes. <laughs> and so I, and in my, as I'm still teaching, you know, uh, even though I should not, uh, I tell my students, you will not learn anything from me. You only learn yourself. However, I will tell you some anecdotes. No, and I have given up, uh, as a mathematician, this is horrible. I have given up making any sense. No? Sense making, uh, that's nice for people who do not really know what to do. <laughs> uh, I do. No? And I get the impression that you um, are also those who think about doing something that is unusual. And I guess... Vis-a-vis -vis the computer, a strange machine that 
at least 50, 60 years ago now, looking back now, uh, it has become totally different because we now carry our computers with us. You know, this is a tiny little uh, instrument, a device that you may lose or not lose. But in the 1960s and before, you enter a huge room full of technology of which you have no clue what it's doing. The only thing you know is if you now sit down uh, by the console and turn this dial somehow and hit these knots, something will happen, but you don't understand it. And then the cultural revolution, the huge cultural revolution of programming, you know, of a new way of expressing something, I have consciously used that term of expressing something. This cultural revolution opened up human endeavors to being based on a machine that is doing what? It is, I use a term that can be uh, spoken in English, but it's not a ger an English word. It's the machinization, you know, like mechanization, machinization, uh, of mental work. This is my concept of the computer. And I believe I was able to formulate this long ago uh, because of this funny stuff that I was doing and that some galleries were friendly enough to put up on their walls. You know, this caused uh, a turmoils in my thinking. I was doing something that forced the computer, a machine, to do something the machine did not want to do. Artists always want to open new doors. And I think this is also a trigger for you today to do something that was not done before in the art world. So, so Anna, reflecting maybe a bit uh, what uh, Tyler and, and um, Frieda mentioned or putting it into your context, what do you think is what you want to achieve in art? What, what is the core of what you are doing? That's such a, um, a great question and a hard one. Um, and I, I have to say that I love what, what, what Frida, what you just said about not being able to teach anything, anyone, um, and people just having to learn on their own. Uh, I really feel that's very true. Um, I feel it very true with, with, with my children too, as, as a mother. Um, and I also really love um, what you said about about um, at, at some point you can't think too much, if I understood you correctly. You just kind of have to do things. Um, and and I feel that as well, very, very viscerally. If I, if I thought too much about what I was doing, perhaps I would just drag my feet forever and perfectionism would, would get in the way or, or something else, you know? Um, but... And what I want to do really is is present poems as works of art in unexpected places and um, rescue, really. I think at this point, the correct word is rescue, classic literature from total oblivion. Um, I had to present recently, I live in Madrid now. Um, so, you know, in Spain, we speak Spanish here. Um, and of course, but I, I say this because I was recently invited by my children's school to present on my work for their high school senior class um, about to graduate, you know, in one month, uh, their digital societies course. So I entered assuming they, you know, they knew what a blockchain was. They had no idea what the blockchain was, um, but they also didn't know who Borges was, Jorge Luis Borges, which is one of the most beloved writers in the Spanish language, you know, and I would understand this if we were perhaps in Germany, um, or Canada, right, where where Spanish isn't um, the the mother tongue, but here, you know, to not know who Borges is as a high school senior, it's like my feeling is like these children are unprepared for the world. What are they going to do when when they graduate? And so I feel very galvanized, I guess, in my in my mission to really present classic literature in ways that um, people engage with now, which is honestly cell phones. Um, and I think that, you know, one of the, the collections that I created with a coder, I'm not a coder, I wish I could code it, I, I'm not able to do that. 
but um but I created it with a coder who who was a, the father of one of my son's friends actually um, my son and his son were both chess lovers and they got to talking and then we got to talking and realized we both love digital art and we created a collection called poems in the public domain where we took 30 poems from the public domain and annotated them um, through his algorithm that he created where he created 14 different handwritings and then I created the personalities of 14 different readers and so there's 14 different readers that are going through, you know, uh, Sappho and Homer and Virgil, um, but also Marianne Moore and Gertrude Stein, and trying to make these poems sort of come to life in a generative algorithmic sense um, through digital art. And, and of course, they can live on a cell phone. And hopefully this means that someone will read them. And I'd love to share a poem that was written actually a hundred years ago by a, a woman who won the Pulitzer Prize in her time and was then for some reason, you know, frowned upon by the Academy of, of, Lang of Literature and not really taught in schools. For me, a special use of, of code, marrying it to poetry. And you can, you can read her poem and you can see how it's being read by this system and being marked and highlighted and like little notes that are important, but also not important um, happen and coffee stains. And we we use different pen colors because we we love, I, I personally really love Roland Barthes statement that um, they who he or she who doesn't reread is destined to read the same story everywhere. Um, so we put little different pen colors so that it, rereading is represented. And um, and we just, I don't know, performed readership on poems that had been forgotten in our time using 100% code um, and emulating the style of Poetry Magazine, which is the most canonical publication in the U.S. poetry establishment, their 1950s sort of um, magazine. So we, we copied that style a little bit. Um, and then you see how the, the paper starts getting dark and it becomes like this palimpsest of shared meaning as different readers um, engage with the text and write their little meaningless or meaningful and and gain, you know, the the sort of that 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 lyricism that can only enrich people's lives that is found through poetry. Tyler, and any reflections on your side about the subjects? I guess I could talk about, like you asked about, um, you know, what's most important in my art practice. Maybe I could tell you about uh, how that's changed over the past couple of several years. I think that it might uh, speak to something. So, you know, I've always been hyper-focused on techniques, sort of on technology. I've never had to ask the question, is what I'm doing art with a capital A? It never, never occurred to me because I'm just doing things on my own in my basement and I'm in my garage for my own kind of pleasure, right? Um, so the art practice that I guess I'm best known for is something that began four years ago before all of this mania with with uh, with NFTs. Um, and I set out to design systems that generate um, abstract sound and animation in uh, synchronously. And uh, I did that with um, a strong intention to use a very minimal tool set. So at the time I started, I used a very old laptop, like 10 years old laptop and uh, like running Linux and only using a C compiler. Um, no extra data sets, no third party programs. Um, and so it, it, seems, it seems like a nerdy challenge, like just like, okay, can I reinvent the wheel? But there was some principles about why I decided to do that. Um, there had been a resurgence uh, in popular interest in analog modular synthesizers during that time. And it was something I wanted to participate in um, I was interested in that when I was younger, but never got the chance. Um, but then when I looked into it further, I discovered there was a lot of parts of the culture that were um, really focused on collecting things that you could buy and showing it off as this expensive magical black box that you don't understand how it works and you get to, you know, perform being a mad scientist and having patch cords and flashing lights. And uh, it seemed odd to me, and I wanted, uh, and they're also like a fetish for vintage electronics. Um, and so um, when I discovered that, I, th I thought, okay, I'm going to try doing the opposite. Rather than, if the if the goal is uh, exploration of sound, um, like I want to focus on that and show that you can do that in other ways without needing to buy anything. 
uh, sort of, you know, using your own knowledge and learning about open up the black box, learn how it works. That seemed to be the spirit of what I remember about when I think about, you know, Bob Moog and Don Buchla and other pioneering like electronic um, uh, uh, people of the 1960s and 70s. So that it was also in response to uh, kind of my personal experience of accelerating rates of, of change in technology. There are so many programs and things I've worked with in the past with for creative pursuits, and I can't even open the projects anymore. The hardware is obsolete. Everything is obsolete. And I was tired of that, those cycles of obsolescence. And so it was a little bit of rebellion. It's like, no, okay, for my own purposes, let me just choose these basic tools and I can tinker away like this for the de remaining decades and I don't have to be bothered. I'm never going to have to really update it. I expect that C compilers will still be around decades from now. So that was that was kind of the, those were the principles for that. Um, then that sort of intersected completely randomly with all that happened with the mania around uh, generative art and NFTs. And that's an interesting intersection. Um, so being part of that um, uh, made me reflect a lot um, and uh, try to ask myself now, try to go back and contextualize, like, what are we doing? What's happening? Um, how, does, how, what, what, how does this make sense? So my art practice has changed a lot since then. Um, and I often use generative system, but it's not the only focus. I try to uh, critically reflect on technologies, including blockchain systems. Um, I incorporate sometimes physical craft of blacksmithing. Um, I, I use uh, satire. One thing to tie it in with with uh, with language is uh, I I generated um, a satirical um, program that um, makes absurd statements about NFTs. Right? It just it's not complicated. It just strings together things like the game Mad Libs, um, and it and it uh, it's to you know challenge. It, they end up being really funny and absurd. Um, but this is this is sort of where my art practice has kind of gone. Tyler mentioned uh, the revolution of blockchain. Um, how important is blockchain for you? you? You are not directly connected to the blockchain from your artistic creations. What does blockchain mean for you? Um, for me, blockchain is, it's, you know, I think it's best understood as a new file storage system. As a, and as a new way of transmitting information and recording also information which is, um, you know, as a writer, it's always wonderful to to have new places to record your your work. For example, you know, Bitcoin allows for an inscription onto, onto the chain um, in a pretty simple fashion. And, and so does, of course, Ethereum, um, but but it can be costlier. But, you know, being able to, to inscribe um, information in a way that's decentralized and in a way that's, you know, hopefully immutable and eternal is quite lovely and poetic. Um, I think that, um, you know, short, short poems are always the hardest to write, especially if, if they're good ones and um, short bursts of text or such as like Tyler's um, absurd statements, which I guess are more absurd is because they're not absurd. A lot of them I think have come true. Right. So that's, that's where the, That, that fine line between absurdity and reality really just um, gets stretched and it's such a delicious um, stretching. But, um, but you know, I feel very actually tied to the blockchain and almost grateful to it because I think that I always say, you know, often say that poetry had a logistical problem and there were, there wasn't perhaps a, a correct way to exchange, exchange poems in a way that reflect their contribution to culture. Um, so you can, of course, buy a poetry book. You know, I've, I've published them, but a 12 euro poetry book doesn't necessarily reflect uh, or honor the craft of the poet in a way that will prove sustainable to the writer. And being able to transact poems that engage with with multimedia, with sound, with visuals, so that you know, in passing, they also perhaps appeal to to younger, newer audiences um, is potentially capable of of sustaining the poet and, and encouraging other poets to to keep writing because I can tell you you know firsthand that the traditional publishing landscape is pretty grim for poets um, you 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 enter the world as a poet um, knowing that you need to find another job like a real job <laughs> but other other creative practices um, at least offer the possibility 
of becoming self-sustaining. If you reach a certain level or if you, you're lucky or you're at the right place at the right time or what have you, or a skill, lots of, lots of those things come into play. Um, but really for a poet, there's just no way to crack that nut. <laughs> You know, uh, you have heard uh, many ideas right now, and um, we had a talk uh, a few uh, uh, two weeks ago, um, and uh, you told me that the code is very important for you. But looking to these two people, it looks as if the code may not be so relevant uh, any longer. Do mm -hmm. you still keep with saying the code is the most important and we have to go down and dig down, as you mentioned it, uh, to understand that, uh, or maybe to understand whether it's code or not is, is very important. So how do you reflect on that, uh, talking to these wonderful young artists that, that are very famous, of course, in, in the blockchain and in the new world? Um, they they have a different view to, to reality, probably. Yeah. <clears throat> they live in a time you know, when... They encounter the machine not naked. Uh, when when I started using computers, they were all naked. No, they are dressed. It's horrible. The police was always coming. What, what is this again? You, you are running around naked here. Uh, now they are nicely <laughs> put dressed. into beautiful shapes. No, uh, I have never used a PC uh, because they were always ugly. Uh, I have only used... Uh, once you could have your own computer, uh, only use those of a company whose name is not uh, pears, you know, but some other fruit <laughs> in order to avoid this. I wanted to make one remark that may perhaps uh, shed a little light uh, in a short, short formulation, namely what we are doing and those have a much easier life who do images, I believe, than those who do texts. Namely, the remark is, think the image, in the case of the image, think the image, don't make it. Now, the, the, the painter in older times, and most of painters nowadays even do this, they stand in front of an empty canvas. They have mounted it, maybe they have grounded it themselves and so forth, an empty canvas. Now they must decide, uh -huh, a first step to decide, which brush do I take, which paint for a first line, a first spot. Uh, it's easy for them if they are Jackson Pollock, they just take the paint and throw it onto the canvas. Uh, okay, then they get a fantastic shape already, but... This formulation, think it, don't make it, is, I believe, the essence of whatever kind of machinery we use to produce whatever kind of aesthetic expression, be it visual, be it auditory, be it spoken, be it to write. Text people, poets, Anna, they are much more daring because with the text, you immediately come over with meaning. Unless you are Kurt, Kurt Schwitters. Mm -hmm. uh, ah, that's that's his great trick. Mm -hmm. Aramuna, alagrada. No, uh, no meaning anymore. So the meaning in the visual arts, at least if you don't um, make figurative pictures, then of course you are lost. But it's no surprise that those images by computer that were not figurative had a much greater appeal than those that were figurative. But between, between the work of art and the artist, there is the computer now. And this we must be, be aware of. In, in the 1960s, uh, that was not so simple. And uh, now the computer, that means a pile of incredibly complex software. Think of any operating system. It's incredible. Think of ChatGPT. 200 people, 200 people worked for two years to produce that software. Think of it. 
how many hours of work that is 200 people two years wow no? uh, and then we use chat gpt and we produce texts uh, they are all fantastic and all boring <laughs> Any reflections of, of the young generation about that, uh, Tyler? <laughs> yeah, a, f uh, a few things. I thought I think that it's interesting to, um, I mean, these are just off the top of my head. What One observation, what we've seen to be very popular within the market of, of generative art in NFTs has been things that resemble abstract paintings of a certain style. Um, and that, I don't know, I find that interesting. I find that to be an interesting observation. It's much, it's much more difficult. My feeling about it is if, if I'm quite honest, um, I think that for it, for, for a lot of this to continue to be relevant, I think that it's going to need to go beyond, um, sort of, I've seen what I see as a narrow formalism of some of the visual generative art that's been popular in the last few years. And I think that that's starting to become apparent. Um, during the mania, it was really uncomfortable um, to, you know, there was m crazy speculation, crazy stories that were being told from otherwise, like, you know, reasonable, intelligent people that were caught up in this. And I think that we're reckoning with that now. Um, and I see, I say this as someone who loves pure formal ex abstract exploration. I mean, that was the motivation. I think that's fun. I think it's a worthwhile endeavor. That was my motivation to begin to do. Um, any of this is just to explore sound and visuals for my own fun and like share it with people. But I think for things to be, you know, like it's true, you can have an AI system generate many, many texts and they're all interesting and they're all boring. And the reason <laughs> why is because it needs to connect to something else, right? What makes things, what in my experience of learning about what, I don't know, trying to formulate my own theory about what art is, it's generally, it's, it's social. It's about, uh, um, it has to, I think that for it to be relevant within current contemporary discourses, it will have to be go beyond um, its own self-contained formalism and connect to other socio-political um, things, examine itself, be self-reflective. And um, yeah, that's that's just some thoughts that that I've been thinking about. Um, before we come to the end, I just want a short round about artificial intelligence, because artificial intelligence, everybody is talking about. It's the hype. Um, you mentioned already, or well, I interpreted, it, uh, Anna, that, that you are not so close to artificial intelligence. Uh, that's not your subject. Um, but I think you, you have some some ideas uh, whether artificial intelligence is revolutionizing art in the next decades what is your your opinion about that i don't use artificial intelligence to write just because that's that's what i love to do and i i, I like to do it sort of with pen and paper but i recognize um incredible creative and practical abilities that artificial intelligence um affords in order to perhaps study um, language and study the way it's been constructed and engage with that um, from a scholarly academic point of view. I think it's it's largely unexplored and, and really fascinating. I think, of course, there's practical uses. I was recently speaking with, with a woman in Spain who um, helped create Maria, Mar, Ocean, dot IA, which is Inteligencia Artificial. So it's um, the, the first Spanish language LLM, actually. And you know, there she's working from the government um, to try to create real practical uses um, to help, like healthcare, to help um, streamline governmental processes. So I think there, it's it's um, amazing. I I do use artificial intelligence quite a bit in my creative visual practice, actually, because I feel that it's fascinating to be able to make language literal via the visual, to be able to enter, for example, a text. Um, a description by someone like Borges into a, a, a you know, a sta stable diffuser or another text to image generator, and then create an image and to really um, explore and dig at what what that makes us feel. Do we like the description, the, the textual one? Is that mu much more of a doorway for our imagination? Do does the visual output make us feel sort of constrained and tied to an idea that perhaps isn't ours? I think that um, leads to very interesting exploration. So I, 
I am a big fan of, of, of playing around with it and definitely probing it um, from an artistic standpoint. Yeah. And Tyler, when the word uh, artificial intelligence comes to you, what, what happens in your brain? Oh, um, well, <laughs> Uh, a lot of things, uh, but uh, so I don't I don't use uh, the technologies themselves, like to try to push limits and stuff. But I'm very interested in kind of the themes surrounding it, about the questions that it raises, about uh, like with respect to art, with authorship, about like what we you know like what is a piece of art in a world where you can generate infinite media, right? And so where how, why why is it different when I create something versus when a machine creates something? And so I think those questions are are very very interesting. Um, I read an article by Ben, the critic Ben Davis, and he talks about uh, ten predictions about unexpected ways that AI will reshape art. And like a lot of these things are not really about you know. Um, in some ways, it will be it will drastically affect everything, um, like all manners of life and stuff. But like with art, like some of it will be critically reflecting on that or in opposition to that or questioning assumptions about those things. So that's that's really where my mind goes. Um, I can talk uh, briefly about uh, about a project that I did. Um, it's about a year and a half ago now and it's right when uh, the image generation, like the Dolly and the, what what's the other, I forget what, Mid Journey, like the image generations where you you prompt them with, uh, with text. Um, so for whatever reason, at that point, I was uh, I was interested in hooking physical things up to the blockchain. Um, I can I can rip my camera off and and uh, maybe show. So here, there, this phone here is connected to the. <laughs> this Great. is connected to the blockchain, right? So people can submit a transaction, and it will make this phone ring. And then they they type a message, and it will ring the phone. And then I live stream it, and then I pick up the the receiver, and it will speak to me in a computer generated voice, right? Like Max Matthews kind of style. And so what I encourage people to do, they can say whatever they want. But I want them to give me instructions. Computer fire. Computer fire. So, you know, prompt me with something. And then later I take some of these prompts and then I interpret them. Just like whatever. Like people will say any manner of things and then I will make something. Whatever it is. Could be a drawing, a poem. It could be a piece of music. Whatever, whatever you want. Maybe just like me doing something. And so... Why, why does that have, why does that have meaning? Like oftentimes, like people feel very attached to it. The people who prompted the thing, they get the piece of art. They see it. It's the social connection. There's like other layers to it. The meaning comes from the network, not just the social network, but just like the semantics of how these, all these things connect, which when you have just a computer and it's a uh, formalist or it's an AI system, the meaning has to come from somewhere and it doesn't just come from that information. It has to come from the connections to wider things. So that's that's how I'm thinking about it. That's how I'm thinking about it right now. Those are the things that interest me about it. So time is running extremely. It is so interesting to talk to you and I could stay here for hours to talk to you. <laughs> um, so, But I have to come to an end. The final word will go to Frida, of course. Um, <laughs> Drop to you, of course. <laughs> yeah, so you are the oldest, uh, the elder statesman. You are yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so you have to do the final word, and <laughs> I would like to know. Uh, you, you come from the '60s. We had uh, coding, computers, digital computers. We have interactivity. We got to multimedia. So there is a process going on. Uh, do you have? Um, a vision or some ideas where you think this will move to or go to? Do you have a, a big picture or even a big picture about the historic development? What is in your mind for a final word? Wow, that's a challenge. <laughs> Susanne, that's a real challenge. I'm not able uh, to say anything very intelligent to this. I I retreat and then tried to get back to this question. I retreat to a remark, just a short remark on AI. You know, I, and on purpose, I now said AI, not speaking out the word behind the AI. You no, know, because then I would say artificial intelligence, uh, and by using the word intelligence together with something artificial, that for me if I were a religious person, would be the greatest sin that is possible. 
namely intelligence is a feature an extremely important feature of life of all life in particular of human life because our intelligence is so incredibly highly developed that we have virtually no understanding of it and then to say oh i here have some software they would never say that that is intelligent i would immediately leave the room and tell that person uh, or tell the students get this fellow and throw him out of the window you know they should immediately be all collected at the south pole uh, and they get wonderful food there uh, but they will never they should never be allowed to enter a university or or a studio of an artist or, and so on artificial intelligence is just the greatest misnomer that humankind has produced and, and you know do, do you know the story you probably know it uh, it was invented in 1956 56 uh, by john mccarthy who was working on a proposal um, for a research project uh, and they were thinking together with marvin minsky they were thinking about now what should we how should we call this in order that they nsf um, that they must give us the money uh, this is the, the ideas that led up to the 1956 dartmouth um, summer school on artificial intelligence this is how the term came into the world no for no purpose then uh, no other purpose uh, than getting money. Okay, uh, finish this. Do I have any clue of the future? It's amazing to which extent, you know, namely everybody is wearing this in their pockets. I'm the only person in the world who does not have a smartphone, by the way. No? <laughs> I don't need this. Uh, it's, it is against communication. And I want to communicate like we do here now. Um, and this kind of um, um, be, uh, brought about the fact that we do talk to each other here now in this hour uh, is caused by technology. This technology has developed to such a high degree that we did not have any problems once that was set up, it functioned. The semiotics of the world. This is what computers have occupied. Computers are semiotic machines. We are semiotic animals. And therefore we can meet in our, in our case it's natural, with a computer it is artificial. Our using science for incredible things more and more the material behind the semiotic systems becomes less important it can never disappear never 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 because we must eat and we also want to make love you know? and we should be i at least i'm always aware of this i'm always aware of i want to have good food and i want to be with other people and both come together in the term, in the concept of love, I believe. Um, the semiotics uh, is such so important nowadays because there is that huge machinery that has grabbed, we have organized it, that has grabbed from us the capacity to deal with science. And that's the human the, the difference between everything else in the world and the human being. We are capable of doing semiotics, science. We invent language science, visual science, auditory, music, fantastic. <laughs> How about art in this context? Yeah, 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 art. Uh, art is a wonderful uh, and permanently continuing and always coming in new forms, in new sensations, uh, in new science, no? entire systems of science. When we talk of the style of take your favorite artist, whoever it may be, no? then what do we admire? We admire his or her 
capability of inventing new worlds of science. The artists are differentiated, one is different from the other, through their particular kind and use of science. It's fantastic. We, we, we live in science. Look, I, I was here <laughs> sitting at my desk at home and I was using my hands. What a stupid thing. No, why did I do this? Uh, because I could not keep just stat static. No. As a good teacher, I should be static and make no movement. This is body language. <laughs> So is, is anybody else in the round uh, willing or wanting to, to give any statement uh, before we leave? Um, Tyler? Uh, or, or... No, no, no statement for me, but just want to I just want to express like I'm, I'm deeply honored to talk with all of you. Thank you so much. It's been a wonderful conversation. Uh, it was really great. Uh, I joined you. I joined you. Fantastic. No? <laughs> I, I will tell next week, I will tell my students, uh, you know what? <laughs> I was in a in a chat and they immediately know what that is. <laughs> and, and there were these international young people. It's incredible no? what they were talking about. Um, I, I, I will do something with the blockchain. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So it was really great. I thank uh, you for your time and your patience to be with us here. And um, I'm very happy that at least two of you I will meet very soon in July. And a bit sad that um, Tyler will not be with us. But of course, I'm very happy that you at least was were able to join us here in this in this round. So it was fantastic. Thanks a lot. And see you in Berlin. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye.